Good evening, everyone. I'm Charlie Kyle, the principal of Venice College. Welcome to tonight's event uh, featuring Jesse Wente and his book, Unreconciled. Before we begin, I will read the land acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. So as I mentioned, tonight is a special night for us because we have as our guest, Jesse Wente, who many of you rem may remember was the Innes uh, lecture speaker last year at around this time in November. And at that time, Jesse delivered a powerful and personal talk um, that to some degree related to the book he's now published and we'll be speaking about tonight. And there'll be more about Jesse before Jesse comes on. But before we do that, I want to welcome uh, as the person who will provide our opening prayer, Elder Debbie Kershen. Um, you may remember Debbie. She's also been uh, part of an event for us before when we showed Tracy Deer's beans. Um, and I will, as a means of introducing Debbie and in, um, in the spirit of how she has asked to be introduced, I will um, read in the first person, which may seem odd, but this is how she has delivered um, her biography to me. And I, I love the way that it, the, present, the presentation is very much in the spirit of Debbie's own spirit. And I like to convey that as best I can by reading it as it's written. So, the spirit name that carries me is Ka Bimose Kanu, Walking Eagle. I am an Ojibwe woman, mother and grandmother. I originate from Sag Keen First Nation where my father was born and my mother is from Pegui First Nation in Manitoba. I'm 59 years old and a residential school survivor. I have found a good red road that has helped me to find a healing and spiritually connected direction in life. I've now been a Sundancer for approximately 28 years. The last 12 years, I've been the Sundance leader of the Dakumas Sundance, which is to say the Sundance Chief. I've been a foster parent for over 30 years as a way of giving back to my community. I'm currently working for Sag King Child and Family Services as the cultural program worker. I'm a social worker by trade and enjoy my work. I feel it is important for our families and communities to have access to their cultural knowledge and heritage. In my personal time, I, involve, I am involved with different community programs, some in Winnipeg and some in Sag King. I've just recently provided teachings and smudging ceremonies for the Red Cross, for the fire evacuees from Bloodvane and Pongasi. I also enjoy providing different traditional cultural teachings, such as women's full moon teachings, among others, in my home community of Sag King. Teachings I share are passed down to me from my elders. And I am uh, honored to introduce Debbie Crochet. Bonjour. Um. Um, my, my spirit name that carries me is an eagle that walks up as a human being, and I am, uh, I am from the Bear Clan, um, also uh, uh, from uh, the Turtle Clan as well. Um, I am honored to be able to, to come in and spend this time to, to say these prayers today and, and uh, have taken the opportunity to to uh, smoke my pipe prior to this, um, and and to do try to do things in in a good way, I'm gonna I'm gonna light uh, my smudge here uh, just so that I have um, a clean space and a clear mind uh, when I'm when I'm doing this work, um, and that uh, that when we do these things, that uh, that it always is done in kindness and in love. So. We thank you, great creator, uh, for your for your love and your blessings. We lovingly ask that you that you bless this work that gets done today. 
we ask in kindness and love for for those uh, hearts, minds, spirits, emotions, and physical being of all that are that are here and involved and listening and participating and and for those words that go out uh, with this with this uh, uh, message that is being brought forward that that those hearts and minds uh, are open to hearing uh, these this important message and uh, we ask Creator that you take care of each and every one of us here that are participating in this in this event today. And for all of those that have come and, and have done this work in order for um, for this to 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 happen and, and to and that uh, that um, they are all blessed and and that they're that they're they're uh, taken care of in the work that they do. This work is very important, and we are grateful, Kishimanitu, for the love, light, and blessings that you bestow upon us. We are grateful for that kindness that you bring. And we ask in a most loving and gentle manner, Kishimani too, that you that you take pity and that you hear our prayer, that you that you help us to to create awareness, that you help uh, with the blessing um, upon a, upon each and every one of us here, and all those that that uh, have the ability to 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 learn from this. To me, good Kishimani too, for for all that you put forth into our lives. We are truly grateful. All my relations, I thank you all um, for listening to this prayer. And um, I ask that the uh, Creator take care of you, watch over you, and that you you remember that you are a sacred being and that you are that you are blessed by the Creator and that you you have direction in your life and let the creator take care of you in, in all that you do thank you so much debbie and uh and i want to say too that uh, thank you for your big heart which i've come to know um i want to take a moment before i introduce our moderator to make a special announcement which uh we're just now able to make and this seems like the uh, most appropriate venue in which to make the announcement, and that is to announce a new award. So I want to express great thanks to generous donors, Audrey Meller and David Paperny. We're pleased to announce the establishment of the Meller Paperny Family Innes Award for Indigenous Students. This award will be given out next year, which is to say 2022, to an outstanding Indigenous student uh, from First Nations, Inuit or Métis, uh, enrolled in the second, third, second, third, or fourth year of studies in the Faculty of Arts and Science at Innes College. Uh, we're particularly grateful for Audrey's and David's leadership and support, and I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share this news with you tonight. It's very exciting, um, and this will now be the second award given to Indigenous students at Innes College, and I hope certainly not the last. Okay. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator. Phelan Johnson is the co-host of CBC podcast, The Secret Life of Canada with Leah Simone Bowen and was the 2020-2021 guest host of CBC Radio's Unreserved. In addition to her hosting roles, uh, Phelan Johnson is a playwright whose works include Salt Baby, Two Indians and Ipper Watch for which she received a Dora Award nomination. Her writing has been featured in Brick, the Canadian Theatre Review, and Granta Magazine. She has also written for television, including Urban Native Girl on APTN, Merchants of the Wild, also on APTN, and the 2020 Inspire Awards on the CBC. Phelan Johnson is Mohawk and Tuscarora Bear Clan from Six Nations Grand River Territory, and was named Wanda McLean's 20 to Watch in 2020. And with that, I bring you Phelan Johnson. Phelan. Thank you, Charlie, for that introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Phelan Johnson. This is my dog, Reg Barkley. Uh, she, if I get boring, we'll just look at her. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Um, so I'm going to introduce Jesse, but I'm sure you all know him because that's why you're here. Um, I'm going to read a bio because uh, I want to read a bio to your face, Jesse. <laughs> 
Jesse Winty is an Anishinaabe writer, broadcaster, and arts leader. Born and raised in Toronto, his family comes from Chicago, and uh, he is a member of the Serpent River First Nation and best known for more than two decades, spent as a columnist for CBC Radio's Metro Morning. And he also worked at the Toronto International Film Festival for 11 years. In February of 2018, he was named the first executive director of the Indigenous Screen Office. Wendy was appointed chair of the Canada Council for the Arts in 2020, the only First Nations person to ever hold that position. Um, but I know Jesse, I've known Jesse for a long time. I've known Jesse since like 20, I don't know, 2008, 2009. Um, I met Jesse when he was the board president at Native Earth Performing Arts, um, something that he speaks about in his fantastic new book, Unreconciled. Um, welcome, Jesse. Oh, thank you so much, Phelan. That's a fabulous uh, introduction. And I'm so glad that your dog is joining us. Yes, <laughs> me too. Um, this is such an amazing feat. So first, congratulations on this. Um, I have to say from a selfish perspective, there was something so fun to read about this um, because I remember I knew you. So these things that you mentioned in here, like trying out chairs at TIFF, like when you mentioned that, I remember because you came into Native Earth and you had a board meeting at the company around that time. And I remember you telling that story. I remember you talking about your, your review of Avatar. Um, and, and uh, you know, me as a really young sort of theater artist, still sort of new to the city, really getting a sense of um, a grounding, a political grounding from you. So uh, it, it, it was such a fantastic read and I absolutely devoured it. And I can always tell when I like a book, uh, when I pick it up and I follow my partner around and I read things to him out loud while he's doing other things and annoy the hell out of him. So congrats again. Um, so for tonight, how things are going to go is I'm going to ask Jesse a few questions. We're going to chat a bit um, and then we're going to ask people to jump in and uh, ask some questions as well. I know we've already got a few that people have sent in, so I'm going to try and get to those. Um, but first, Jesse, I want to start off by asking you, you know, many people know you as someone who is a media maker, uh, a critic, your column on Metro Morning. Um, why a book? Where did this idea come from? How did it come? Yeah, uh, well, thank you for, for uh, uh, all of that, uh, Phelan. And I'm quite honored that you would say that you took any sort of political understanding from me. That's, um, that's something. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Elder Debbie uh, as well for her very generous uh, words uh, 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 to introduce this, this panel. Um, you know, I'd been asked a few times to write a book, and I'd always said no previously um, because I, I, didn't, um, I didn't think I really had much to say or a uh, story to tell. Uh, and then uh, 2017 sort of happened, I think, when I look back on it, I think 2017 sort of happened to all of us in a way, um, in that there was a lot going on. There was, it was the sesquicentennial. Uh, there was some discourse in the sort of public sphere that was occurring at that time around cultural appropriation and all sorts of things. And I mean, it was quite literally cultural appropriation that sort of launched this book in that, um, I realized, I guess I did have something to say, or that year made it feel like I had something to uh, say or a way to say it. And um, and yeah, that was really, that was really the, the it just felt like suddenly I, maybe it crystallized for me what I could say in a book. Um, and then it took me four years to write the thing, so. Uh, a little bit more challenging in many ways than I would have imagined. But I think it was really about, it was just timing, like so many things. <clears throat> um, it was just time, you know. Uh, I, I don't think if I'd written a book previously, it certainly wouldn't have been this book. And um, after it all, and you know this quite well, a failing as an artist, you know, you go through this cycle with the things you create where you really love them when you start. Then there's a period where you really hate them. And then there's a period where you really love them. And I think I'm, I've arrived back where I'm pretty comfortable with the book and uh, proud of how it, it turned out. And so I'm glad that I waited. 
and and it's interesting. Uh, I know my publisher and my agent are probably not thrilled when I say this, but in a lot of ways, I'm actually glad it took so long because things happened, life happened, um, that are in the book that wouldn't have been if I had rushed it or had really done it in response to any single one thing. And I'm um, so like we're often taught uh, by our elders is that like things happen when they're meant to happen. And this is, I, I think that that is pretty much true of this. It happened when I was in a place where I could do this work and, and write this book and that even the length of time it took was all to make sure it turned out like this. And um, I'm glad, I'm glad that you're able to, uh, I can contribute in some small way to you annoying your partner. <laughs> oh, I'd find another way if it weren't for you. Don't worry. Um, but the book, the book is, you know, I think it's, a, it's part, it feels part political. It feels part personal. And it also feels like it's partially about your, your career, your profession. Were you nervous to, to go down that road of talking about yourself and your work so, so publicly? Yes, very much so. Um, I'm still nervous about it, even though I've published a whole book about it. Because, you know, it, it's um, uh, when I was doing the radio or in any of the work, like, it never, it, it was never, it never occurred to me that, that I would be the story or that that was, um, that's just not, I mean, you've known me long enough to know that's not really how I ever sort of imagined it. I was very engaged in ensuring other people could tell stories and um, in, in trying to create those spaces. And um, I guess it had never, you know, and I had been very cautious in my time on the radio to not reveal very much about myself. Um, you know, I think for a lot of people, for example, maybe even up until this moment, you know, a lot of people heard me on the radio never knew I was uh, Anishinaabe or First Nations or anything like that for many, many years, probably a decade of me on the radio at least, um, because it just didn't, it, it, it didn't come up. I didn't talk about myself in that way. Over time, I learned to sort of share snippets to very similar to the way the book turned out to personalize things that I was talking about um, to give people a glimpse into what, what I was like. Like I was most comfortable sharing my passions, but not so much me. So I was very comfortable being like the movie geek, but not so much being uh, the Anishinaabe or, or in that way. I, I hadn't, it didn't strike me at that moment that that was uh, necessarily germane to the subject at hand uh, all the time. Um, so what changed? So it felt like that, uh, you know, I guess it was, it was in, you know, again, to go back to 2017, I guess it just crystallized that um, in my growing understanding of my own life, which is the journey I think some of us are all for fairly consistently on is understanding this journey and, and understanding my family and seeing what um, Canada was going through and where our community was going through. It suddenly felt that like telling the personal part would actually be a way to get to the, the other part. Mm -hmm. And that um, there was experiences that I've had in the life that are unique. I mean, we all have unique lives, but that um, it might afford me an opportunity or afford me a perspective that um, would both resonate for, for uh, you know, our cousins is maybe the way I would put it, uh, Phelan. Mm -hmm. So resonate, but also resonate for everyone else as well. Uh, on some level and you know if I've, I've found that useful like if there's times when you know I find it impossible frankly to approach some of the issues that I've been asked to address over the years say like residential schools like I don't know how to approach that without it being personal mm -hmm. because it just is part of my family's story so, like, I don't know how to do that, 
really. Mm-hmm. Like, and I don't know if I ever, I don't think I could teach anyone. I don't know. Like, I don't think it's possible. So, um, and I said, th- but I think for some, the useful thing, and I hopefully this, this was certainly the attempt with the book. It's what I do in my speeches a lot is you give a sort of a personal face or a personal note to what are issues that seem beyond the personal often. And um, so it is like a strategic thing, but also like, you know, I wrote this book, you know, the book's dedicated to my grandmothers. So it's definitely for them, for both uh, Norma and Barbara. Um, Cause they were just hugely important people in my life, just, and in our, in my, the trajectory of my family's life, like they, it was them that really it all circulated around. The men had much less to do with it. If I'm honest, it was really they usually dope. do Jesse. I know. I know. <laughs> so true. It's just so true. But it was like the decisions made by the women that really all these years later were the major sort of key things. And, um, and then the other people I wrote for was my children because, uh, you know, I guess in 2017, there's a few things like um, there was an urgency at that moment where I felt for a couple of reasons, it was something about that moment that I wanted to capture that feeling. If you, I, not that I really want to go back there, but there was something about that year, even though I would admit now, I think that year made me really sick um uh, in a lot of ways um so i wanted to capture that energy but all there was also an urgency because certainly in 2017 it f- it felt like i didn't know how long i had to tell the story and my kids are you know they're just they're teenagers now so they're like um you know 14 and and about to be 15 so this is not a book like they're, you know, that they're going to read right now. I wouldn't expect them to read this book right now. Certainly I didn't, wouldn't have expected it when I started writing it, when they would have been even younger, but it is a book that I hope maybe they will read one day to sort of, I guess, just to know who I was as much as anything else, because you know, I think this is true of all kids with their parents is you sort of don't always know who your parents are until like later in life. And I was just worried that I wouldn't be there to tell them. And so that was also why the book is, has so much of that personal stuff is that it's for them to understand because they've lived through so much of this, but sort of like kids do, like, they're witness, but I don't know how much they've processed it and maybe they will later on. So I just wanted to maybe give them something to help them with all of that. So I think all of that's why the book sort of ended up the way it did. I think, I mean, cause one of the words that I come, I came across time and time again in the book was like humanize. And I think the best way to humanize something about, you know, something like mascots or something about cultural appropriation we're always asking to be humanized as indigenous people, like something that's like something we're like really vying after is to be seen as human beings. And so I think the personal angle feels like I know for, for myself in my work, it feels like something that I put forward because I want, because I feel like it's the fastest way to get someone to recognize me as a human being, as an indigenous human being. So I think it, you know, it, it was, it was lovely to get that window in, into your life. Um, in much of the book that you, you, you talk about indigenous identity, you know, whether it's talking about being status or not status, living on reserve or off reserve, uh, the length of your hair, uh, comes into play. Yeah. And this, this seems like a constant struggle for a lot of indigenous people. I'm curious, why, why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I think that's an intentional outcome of colonialism. Uh, and I think it's important we actually acknowledge I think it's important for us just to not uh, internalize these things that, um, you know, that like our identity is, is, has been under pretty direct attack for our identity and our sense of belonging and our, our kinship and all of those systems that we had for thousands and thousands of years 
all of that has been pretty aggressively attacked for a couple hundred years at this point. And so, and we can, we can take that in to ourselves. And I think we do, I know I did and, and still do. And it's, you know, you mentioned humanize and being human. Uh, I think that's sort of the whole thing, isn't it? Uh, under colonialism. And I don't think that's just true for first nations or Métis and Inuit people. I actually think that's, true for everyone because i do not think these are human systems that i think they they are meant and colonialism being you know the 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 chief one like a lot of its um the mechanics of it are are around dehumanization and we're we are now live in a world sort of run by the systems of it these these things that put into place that just continue that process and uh and so much of i think our struggle these days is actually to try to regain our humanity and our own understanding of our humanity not just that we're seen as human but we understand that ourselves i mean uh, elder debbie even spoke of that you know beforehand i know with a lot of the elders i talk with that's what they touch on i know in therapy that's what i'm trying to touch on i actually think that's the decolonial work or we actually have to do is it, it's actually about wrecking understanding what it is to be human. And I know that sounds um, like we should all sort of understand that. I don't think we do. I actually think, uh, I think these systems have really uh, distanced us from that understanding. And so I think it's important that we acknowledge that like the whole piece about a belonging and identity that one of the goals of colonialism was to make that incredibly complex, incredibly fraught, uh, open to interpretation or manipulation um, uh, as, as a tactic, because, you know, again, the, the sort of root goal of, of all of this is, is to eliminate us. And so if it can make us not, if it can make us not want to identify or to be, make that impossible, win that's the win that it wants right and if and if we think of you know just the particular uh, attack on that of residential schools like that was clearly the goal right was to try to make those kids not want to identify as who they were to leave their communities not speak the language never go back give it all up one day they could turn around hey there's no more of these people that we signed this treaty with off to the races um, that's it. And so I think for us, it's important to a not burden ourselves with the bullshit that has been placed on us. And that is so hard, uh, so hard, but we sort of have to, and, um, really try to invest again into our own understanding of these things and how we would, I'm often so much in this work, especially these days, Phelan, what I, constantly i'm thinking of is okay how would we do this if we didn't have to if we could just do this these things ourselves like pretend there isn't all of these other things like let's imagine that all the first nations decided we need it needed an arts council which by the way we never did because we didn't think of it that way, but let's place ourselves where we decided we need to do this. How would we have done that? Like, how would we, that's how I approach the ISO. Like it's, we never would have done it this way. Uh, honestly, like we wouldn't have, we just didn't conceive of the separation of these things or like the storytelling would be something that you fund over here and you just like it's not how we it's not how we organized at least on the Anishinaabe side I, I, I won't speak for any other First Nation but certainly not how we organized ourselves um, and so we, even when it comes to identity I think it's and we're seeing this in the discourse uh, you know in the last year uh, and I and you know I think we'll see it in the future if I can uh, give a spoiler alert but like I think what what we're hearing is the community wants us to um, try as best we can to go back to our ways, which is asking people, who are you? Where do you come from? Who is your family? Mm -hmm. Simple questions. We understand that 
some of those simple questions may yield complicated answers, but we're okay. We're here for that because we all understand why they're complicated, but um, that, that is the work. And if you don't know those answers, that's the work you are facing and you have to do. And um, this is part of our healing and we need to keep that in mind. And it's, and, keep this idea of our healing separate from whatever the colonial power is actually doing, because it's not actually the same thing. And increasingly, I think we, and again, this is evidence in my, my career trajectory and how some of the decisions I've made, increasingly, I think we have to invest in ourselves and not so much in reforming whatever has been built here that we're adapting to. Because, like, and I say this as someone who still works inside colonial institutions and wants to help them, but uh, I'm getting old and I don't know how much more patience I will have for that. And we don't need the permission to do these things. And we should stop, increasingly we should stop asking, like, like, uh, and that includes about how we understand ourselves and those identities, and it is fraught. And uh, but I, I, I sort of I don't want to own it the way they want us to own it. I want us to uh, embrace who we are as part of that that return to understanding what it is to be a human being, which I think for certainly in all the nations that I've now been, been privileged to visit all over the world is sort of a common factor is that we understand, we understand us as human beings and what that means in this place. And um, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if I answered, got all the way there failing on the answer on that. Oh one, but... yeah. No, I was mostly, yeah. I mean, I just, I think it's something that, you know, reading your book at, you know, what struck me, and it's a thing that I think is really common in a lot of Indigenous communities, you know, it's definitely something that I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've struggled with, and lots, I know lots of other Indigenous people have, our identity is, you know, we're always grappling with what it means to, what it means to be, but I want to touch on this, because you're kind of headed in this direction that I'm, that I'm interested in going in, because there was this huge section in the book about, I'd say, like three quarters of the way through to the end, where I, it was pretty emotional for me, had some tears, not going to lie, um, where you spoke about some of the struggles that you've had over the course of your career, um, pushing back against these, these big institutions, places like CBC, places like TIFF. Um, and I knew some of these things, um, you know, I'd, I'd heard your columns, um, you know, I'd, I'd known of some of these, these struggles that you had uh, come up against, but I didn't have that intimate window into how they had impacted you. Um, you know, I think about things like the, you know, appropriation prize and the work that you, the very vocal work you've done around mascots. Um, leaving TIFF, that was a lot of stuff that, that was a lot of stuff that I didn't know. Um, I mean, I knew it, but I didn't, I didn't know what it was like for you inside of those moments. And so I'm wondering now, now that you're a few years away from those things, how was it for you in the writing of this book to revisit those moments? Mm. Hard. Um, I mean, it sort of varies. And I mean, I, I, I'd be interested in you, in, for you. I've never got to ask you, but I would love to your answer to the same question um because i you know it sort of depends on the emotional attachment i have to the memory and like what i what i'm working through like the mascot stuff not a problem like um that stuff i could handle some of the other was more more difficult and um yeah like it was um this, you know, the this, this stuff that really got me and still gets me is, you know, the stuff around my grandmother and, you know, there's some stuff in, in there uh, around the threats and stuff that I don't like to go back to because it's not, you know, it's just not that much fun to, I mean, it's, I mean, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't had the pleasure yet. It's not fun to receive death threats and 
it's not fun to remember when you used to receive them all the time. Luckily, it's been a while for me. And I, uh, I have to say, that is one of the surprising things about the book. I had sort of prepared myself for some pretty negative reaction to the book and knock, knock wood so far. It's, um, it's been okay. So, uh, so some of that stuff's hard because I don't like to like, there's, I'm still have sort of emotions that I, I deal with around that, that stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, it was, it was hard. It's still, there's parts of sometimes that I wonder, ah, should I have included it like that? You know, there'll be, there'll be parts of that for me, I think. Um, but at the same time, it, it's for me, again, if you think about what, who I was writing it for, like, um, to me, that was some of the stuff that I needed my kids to understand because those aren't stories that I'm going to pull them aside one day and say, let's sit around the fire and listen to this uh, yarn about, uh, <laughs> you know, about that, that night mom and I had a run in with the, the cops or, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, or any of those sorts of things like, no, but I do want them. I think it would, it would later in their lives. I think it would help them. Um, I hope it'll help them understand a bit. So like it was important for me to include them and again also f there was like it's just it's what happened like i and it felt like sharing some of that stuff would be important so because what i have found very helpful is when other people share things and i realize i'm not alone uh as your dog uh, uh, gets a better position um <laughs> That you know, and I, and I think yeah, you hear you and I are talking on virtual Zoom, two years into a pandemic that has kept most of us in our homes, uh, or a lot of us anyway that could could stay in our homes or apart from each other anyway. And it's like um, I think one of the things with the human condition is we can often feel like you're alone, uh, and the answer is usually almost always that you're not. That there's other people that have had the same experience, have had similar feelings, know what you're, and so there was some of me also wanting, because, you know, I've had a very privileged life. I've, I've had the opportunity to do some things that are unique, and but I'm also very determined that I won't be the only First Nations person to do those things. So maybe there's also some idea of like, for whoever comes along behind, if they encounter these things, they'll know it's okay. Like there's a way that you can get through them. You can move past them. There's another end of them. And uh, that's how we'll build and build and build and how ultimately this place will return. How we'll get back everything that was taken. Jesse, I'm wondering um, if you could uh, perhaps read a bit for us. Sure, I can give that a shot. Uh, so if people are interested, I'm going to read from uh, page... Uh, this is... Uh, oh, I just moved my sticky note. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, page 146. Uh, I think it's chapter 12. And uh, so here we go. Usually, I'd review three movies in my five-minute segment. The logic was that reviewing two big studio pictures would allow me to highlight something I thought was important for the audience to pay attention to with the third slot, which was usually how I seeded Indigenous content in my columns. For the Avatar review, I let my producer know that all five minutes would be spent on the one movie. When I filed my script the night before we went to air, the response I got was, wow, this is going to be interesting. As I've noted, the fact that I was Indigenous had probably come up before in my columns and appearances, but it had never been a central feature in a discussion. So I knew that this review could potentially change my professional identity forever, that after fighting so long to be taken on my merits as a critic, rather than pigeonholed as the Native critic, I might, in five minutes, be pigeonholing myself. But I also knew that Avatar would be a pop culture phenomenon, and that most people who saw it, saw it 
would miss its racism unless they had it pointed out to them. I was more anxious about going on air than I'd been in years. And I felt that the substance of the review had to be my reaction to the film as an Indigenous person. If I didn't include more of myself than I was truly comfortable revealing, the point wouldn't land with the same force. So I said what I said. I began by praising Cameron's technical prowess and correctly predicting that Avatar would be the biggest box office success of all time. And then I gave voice to my anger and pain and described the immense harm the film would do to Indigenous people. Any remaining anxiety evaporated as I spoke. And in the end, I thought the whole thing had come off very well. Back then, my routine was to go for breakfast at a diner near the CBC building each week after my Metro morning appearance. That week, I barely made it out of the studio when messages started rolling in from First Nations people who'd heard the piece. By the time I was out on the street, I knew the reaction to this column was different from any other I'd ever delivered. Indigenous people from across the country, including people I'd idolized in the arts, were reaching out to tell me how happy I'd made them. Again and again, I read some version of, I can't believe I heard that. Thank you so much. It's unbelievable that you just did that. I'd always been extremely reluctant to speak in a way that could be taken on taken as on behalf of the Indigenous community. The sense of having no right to claim that voice linked back to the feeling of not being Indigenous enough or not being the right kind of Indigenous person, a feeling I've known most of my life and can, can't, still can't fully shake. But it also came from a recognition of the folly of any one person thinking they could speak for a group so vast and varied. But as I sat there in the diner, waiting for my breakfast. I was able for the first time in my life to think, if people are going to be okay with me going on the air and talking this way, then I feel safe doing it. As the messages and emails continued to roll in, I saw just how many in the First Nations community had yearned to hear that kind of response to a major Hollywood event, and how many felt I'd been their champion. I didn't need to hear from any other community after that. I'd heard the only opinions that mattered. Heading into the studio, I'd feared how that review might alter my career. Looking back, though, I can see how it acted as a turning point. One that, instead of pigeonholing me, opened up new worlds to explore. It showed me how I could speak for myself while also bringing my community along. How I could use my platform to speak against the injustices Indigenous people face in this country and around the world. And how that effort would be met with solidarity and gratitude. I am so thankful for that support and trust. I am so thankful for each of the messages I received that day and for every message a First Nations person has sent me since. They gave me the courage and energy to continue this work. They guide me in the right direction. They let me know that I'm not alone, that everything we face, we face together. They show me that no threat, no hate-filled person can shut us up. They remind me that we speak the truth. And when the truth is fully acknowledged, meaningful change can spark and spread like fire. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely part of the emotional part for me, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I've never seen Avatar. <laughs> oh, what a... I've never met an Indian who's never seen Avatar. I've never seen it because I remember you coming into Native Earth and talking about it. And I said, I'm not going to see that movie. And I never saw that movie. What a, what a wonderful and, thing. And I, I had fights with my family at dinners about it because they were like, well, you have to see, you have to see it. If you, you know, how can you judge it? And I was like, I don't need to see it. I know I don't need to see it. <laughs> so wow. That's uh well, I'm proud of that. I don't know. I, I can sometimes struggle to be proud of things, but. Oh, I'm no. proud of that. That's uh, that's hilarious. I remember. I remember. I think you brought something into the office, into Native Earth's office when we were in the distillery district. And I think it was like a piece of paper that broke down the parallels between Pocahontas and Avatar or something. And it was on the door and we all looked at it. And I was like, I'm not going to I'm not going to see that movie. Um, 
and I, you know, in preparation for tonight's conversation, I, I, I went back and watched some of, you know, some of your columns on Metro Morning and some of your work and listened to you speak. And I have to say, it still brings so much joy to me to, um, I was doing my dishes earlier and listening to one and it still gives me that, yeah, <laughs> like I still get that feeling. So, you know, I, uh, I, I know no one can speak for all Indigenous people, but I mean, I think you've done a hell of a job so far, Jesse. So uh, uh, well, now for that. thank you so much for that. I remember the first call I think I got was from Yvette Nolan that morning, uh, who's uh, an auntie I still talk to an awful lot. And uh, she was, as you know, Yvette, she was exactly like, she was like, yeah, like that was, she, that was her whole thing. She was like, man, you slayed that. And, um, you know, again, that was sort of repeated. And I'm sure you've experienced that. Like the validation when you're so interesting, like, and I wonder if other artists from other communities feel the same way, but like, our relationships have, are so fractured, are so challenging sometimes, we, even with our own community. But, and, you know, listen, I sit here, I, I should I should do right by the university and say they gave me this lovely Arbor Award uh, recently, the University of Toronto. I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to share that on social media. So sorry, I haven't got to that, but I will get to that. But um, like, I, I, but for me, like, those words of encouragement from our community like that's what uh gets me because like i don't know it's it just it it means so much it feels like home and and i that's it, it just yeah it 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 brings us something uh it that recognition uh from our own community is really impactful. And I hope, you know, I remember those moments and I, I hope I've tried to do that exact same thing with as many artists as, as a, and storytellers as I could is be their cheerleader, to be there and say, you can do it. You're great. You're, you know, what you're doing for the community is great and help them in the same way that all those aunties and uncles help me. And I'm sure you have the same similar people in your life failing that do that because, you know, uh, it's hard for us a lot of the time and we need that encouragement and that um, that hug from our community because it can feel we can feel so distant uh, and again by no fault of our own and no fault of theirs by the intent of this place is why we feel it and when we break through uh, you know uh, I get emotional thinking about it because it is just still, as a middle-aged man, it's still so important just to, uh, to know that uh, people think I'm doing okay. Like that's, because as soon as they did, as soon as I got the, uh, you're not doing, I would, I'd be out. I'd be like, because uh, I think that is the responsibility we understand with our communities is like, you don't do this work. Uh, I wrote it down because as uh, Elder Debbie said, and it's something our elders, certainly our Anishinaabe elders say a lot, which is um, we need to, it's important to do this work in a good way. And that's a phrase we use a lot in a good way. And to be acknowledged that you are doing it in a good way is huge. Like Debbie said uh, those words to me before we even came on the air, you know, so important because you know, my mom probably didn't get that validation really from the community. She wasn't as, was different generation. So she was sort of removed because of the way, what happened to my grandmother. And, but my family's come back to where we're part of it again. And we're doing our best to help. And yeah, so hugely, hugely important stuff. And it's not just Anishinaabe. We can all do things we should all be thinking of how we do things in a good way. And if you really think about what that means, it's actually a very powerful idea of, of how you approach work and life is to do things in a good way. Well, I think you've done things in a good way. Um, I know for myself as someone who's indigenous and who is now working in media, somehow transitioned from working as a 
theater kid and snuck in the back door at the CBC and is still finding their footing. I, I like, I want to say now for helping to clear that path, because when I watch those Metro morning columns, when I look back at your work and the, and the path, the foundation that you have laid, and I know it's been laid by lots of other indigenous people coming through that space. Um, but hearing someone be so, so outspoken gives me, um, the strength to feel like um, one, well, it gives me the strength to feel like I can do it. And two, I understand the responsibility in being in that building. So now for that, Jesse, we're going to ask questions now from the audience. So um, okay. I've, yeah, I've got to, I've got four that came in um, upon registration. So I'm going to start with those ones with the keynote okay. questions. Um, so question, uh, this is the first one. How do we best help our non-Indigenous neighbors understand the necessary urgency and complexity of building equitable relationships? Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, maybe the answer is sort of, A, so obviously I, I believe in telling your story and the power of that. Uh, humans are the storytelling animal. That is sort of, that's our gift uh because we're you know we're not that great at say for example like feeding ourselves by just like uh grabbing something with our our claws and eating it like uh we're not really good at that so we tell stories and we figure out we build things to do those you know help us figure that out so storytelling obviously i think is is a key to humanize and to be seen as human um, it becomes really undeniable once you know someone's story to actually see them as not human. So I think that would be another one. And as a connection to that, um, I think increasingly what we should actually do is if we as uh, Indigenous people or First Nations people or Métis or Inuit people, let's heal. I, I increasingly want to heal ourselves. And if we can get ourselves back to being fully human again and live as whole human beings, I can't help but think others will see that and begin to understand the difference. And in fact, we, we can see some of our cousins do live as closer maybe than uh, I've ever gotten yet to that. Uh, and I'm still, I think the world still doesn't quite grasp what that is. Cause when I look at, you know, what some of our people are uh, doing out on the West coast and uh, some of the things they do well, all over the world, part of that is the humanness, right? Like we protect the land because we understand it's of us and we are of it. And if you're in touch with your actual humanity, that becomes undeniable that this is all we're just part of something much much larger than ourselves and that we live in relationship with that thing and we if it's not healthy we're not going to be healthy like that's just the equation we exist in and so um i would say also that it's like a lot of it let's heal ourselves in our own communities and let maybe that be the guiding light uh as opposed to and I say this again as someone who does a lot of hand work, um, but I don't. I don't think we all have to do that. Is maybe how, how I would put it. Is um, let's. It's. Uh, I'm willing to take that one for the team. <laughs> I, I guess. And I, what I would love it is if the team could then, if we're all healing ourselves and doing that work, then eventually I don't actually think we'll have to hand hold. They will. This is prophecy stuff where I'm sort of talking a bit. If you know uh, the Anishinaabe prophecy around eighth fire, it's like when we start living that way, they they will understand. It, it will be hard to deny. So I just think that part of it is actually working on ourselves and letting us being healed. Uh, I think that will go a long way to healing relationships the earth a whole lot of stuff if we can get there ourselves and it's a lot because it's not like we're just not still being harmed we are on a daily basis but um i i ever more i, I see that decolonial work actually begins uh, right here for for us anyway mm. all right next question 
I am an indigenous youth and I'm interested in the topic of finding my indigeneity. I have virtually no concept of my culture and I feel stuck in between. I feel misunderstood in the city, but also too white and not Indian enough for my cousins on the res. I was wondering if you have any advice. Well, I mean, there's a, as you mentioned, Phelan, there's a few chapters in my book that sort of <laughs> touch on that. Um, first of all, I would say you were, you're not alone. This is something uh, many people face. I think the best place to start is with yourself again. Who are you and who is your family? If you, if you don't know, start to ask. Like, uh, you can ask your own family. You can start, you know, if you know the community, you can start there. And, um, you know, you ha- it seems so daunting. But the thing is, our communities know this. And we know who our people are even when they're lost, uh, you know, and the communities, it's complex. It's not without complicated, but there's a huge lot. There's a lot of generosity and grace. I think in terms of our communities know this is the reality. And I think a lot of them, I I know certainly with my community, uh, Ganabajing on the North shore, like a big part of it is trying to, bring people back and that's that means uh, reconnecting so don't if you do know which community reach out that's the first place maybe you've got family there even if you don't they will know your family start there if not that i mean certainly start that research but also you know we're luckily unlike when i was a kid when there wasn't a First Nations Center or Native Canadian Center in downtown Toronto, certainly before there was First Nations House at UFT or any of that stuff, there those things are now in existence. Go there. Don't be afraid, like I was. I write in my book about how like I went and got totally intimidated by a drum circle because I never drummed. And like, oh, I can't go back there. I'm too ashamed. As a 47-year-old guy, I would sit and drum and not be ashamed at all because. I didn't do this to myself. Uh, don't. So again, don't put what was, what happened to you is what, that you did it. You did not Like, this is what has happened to us. And so it's okay to just, I know it's tough, but like, you know, approach it. And again, our communities are so there for this. And, um, uh, I guess that would be, that's sort of the best advice I can give. And also like I found community in the arts uh, in, in Toronto in in, in the indigenous arts community. Um, that's probably where I was like first really accepted and learned so much from all these people like that, that can be community and those folks can help guide you because they'll all, you know, you spend enough time there. They'll all say, well, you, a, they'll all ask you where you are, where you're from, but also they'll help guide you. You'll meet, cousins you may like that's how this works so um start going to that stuff like uh, go to native earth start it, or whatever your interests are if, if you're not an artistic uh, or you know in if that isn't your zone there's other we live in an age now where there's lots of places to gather and do that being 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 community come and and Uh, Again, I think, I know it seems daunting because of the, uh, you know, all the shit about people who claim indigeneity, but don't necessarily have those things. And it can make it complex for people who are are disconnected. But I would encourage those folks to not be daunted. Like, um, that that's not, that's not actually a reflection. They're two separate things. They're not the same thing. And, and we let that one thing cloud this other thing and that they're not the same. And our communities inherently understand that. And um, so, yeah, explore and start, start here, start with your family and um, start with an elder. Just like a great way, like listen to them and, and, and what they would have to say, um, bring your tobacco when you go see them and, uh, and just start and, Try, I know it's hard, but just try to let the fear go away and that shame stuff go away because it's not yours to carry. It just isn't. It's 
it's they want you to carry it and it is just not yours to have to carry jesse congrats on your book i really got a lot out of reading it you talk about canada still being a colonial settler state how do we best understand this and how it impacts our behavior today yeah well uh i mean i think it's interesting i think um we have a lot of pretty stark reminders that it's a settler colonial state in the past week or so. Uh, one should only need to turn on the news to go, oh yeah, there, look, the militarized force invading unceded indigenous territory. That's rings familiar. Um, uh, so like, I think there's the obvious where it demonstrates that it, it still is that way. Um, I think that the, the the more important part in, in, in what I would, I guess what I would say is A, Canada is not alone in this. The entire world was reshaped by colonialism 500 years ago. It is literally what we are all trying to unpack and get out from under 500 years later because it's destroying the planet and each other and us. And so like literally every social justice movement you can name, its root is colonialism whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it's Me Too, whether it, you name it, they're all the same. They all come from the same source. And uh, so Canada is not unique in its history, in its tactics. It's actually just part of a, of, a, of, a, of a breed. Where it could be unique, though, is actually doing the genuine work to undo that. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, Canada, so like Canada was formed by an act of a foreign parliament, if you know the history of how Canada was formed. The British North American Act was passed by British Parliament. Uh, if you read it, which most Canadians have not, but if you do read it, it's actually basically, basically an incorporation document. Uh, so the Canada was basically set up as a company with the idea that it would extract resources from this land and ship them overseas to enrich your, you know, England. And it, it, that's literally what it says. If you read it with basically the Hudson's Bay company, the ones in charge, uh, but that's like literally what it says. And so if you actually think about how Canada then has acted in the last 150 years, you sort it suddenly sort of dawns on you. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Like if, <laughs> If you're basically like a big mining forestry slash everything company with the sole goal of like stripping the land and ship, right, then everything Canada has sort of done up until today sort of has been in service of that. We've actually exported that, right? Uh, most major, you know, Canada is the number one, I think, mining nation in the world. Right. So we've exported that aspect of colonialism all over the world. And so that means that Canada was like founded and like my nation, uh, which signed the Huron Robinson Treaty, which predates Canada, was signed in 1850. It's still being litigated by the Supreme Court of Canada, of Ontario, where they just lost. And by the way, they'll probably appeal in which they will lose again, because just to know, just so folks realize, like, you, Canada so broke the treaties it signed, it can't even win in its own courts. Like that's, if you think of contractual law, like that's how bad this went. So like your own legal system goes, yeah, blew it on that one. And like, so I don't know where, like that's not our problem. That's sort of, uh, you know, not our issue. And so if Canada's formed without our consent, this is why Canada continues to be nervous about its own legitimacy and sovereignty, why it's nervous or undecided around its own identity and culture mm -hmm. and all of these sorts of things, because it didn't actually form in the way that would allow it to have those things. Namely, if it had gathered our lot up, which I know so complex to, meanwhile, we were gathering as nations long before Canada ever was into a thing. But anyway, gather us up and actually come to an agreement that, that this could exist. And the, the thing that, Cana that I think Canadian history sort of, is that like, we would have done that. Like our ancestors signed those treaties. Like I think of my community, like 
they were sort of up for Canada. Like if it was going to be a thing, like they recognized, ah, they're here. Uh, we don't, we're not really a culture that says go away. Like that's sort of not what we do. So you're here. We can share. There's a lot of here. And like, and so I fundamentally think what Canada has to do is sort of start over. And I know that seems daunting, but it shouldn't because, you know, democracy in Canada is roughly 60 years old, right? Indigenous people got the vote in 1960. Before that, I'm not sure you can claim that democracy truly existed. The country itself is only 150. That's like a baby country. So we could, we could do it right. And, and the funny thing is, after all this shit, I think First Nations people would still sort of be up for it if, like, if some things were rebalanced on a pretty big scale, which maybe is how Canadians should actually view uh, reparations and ultimately reconciliation, which would be actually this, would be us sitting down to rewrite the Constitution and entrenching Indigenous sovereignty and Canadian sovereignty all at the same time. Um, which I know sounds like a fantasy land, but honestly, I think that's the only way Canada will get to continue to exist in the long run. And I say that because I'm, you know, the, the Mohawks, the Ojibwe, we've been here a really long time. Like our communities know each other very well. Uh, we didn't always get along, let's be honest, but, um, like we're going to still be here. Like that's like the, our nations will still be here. I know that is true. It's Canada. That's the one that's sort of more up in the air. And I think it needs to do that hard work that it didn't do, that it avoided doing because it didn't view us as full humans. It didn't think we would still be here to say, yeah, actually you should do that. And by the way, you probably need to make up for like the several hundred years in between these events um so but that isn't the reality we live in we're still here we're going to get back everything that was taken whether canada sort of wants to or not and i think it would behoove canada to actually do that work and if canada wants to be a world leader what that would be the crowning achievement of world leader would be to re like uncolonize yourself and reform your constitution based on indigenous sovereignty like you would be the first Canada. Like you would, you really want to make history. This is it. Other people had socialized medicine before. This is the big one. Like this is the one you could, you could put in big flashing red lights and we would actually say, yeah, you could go to the UN and talk about that if you did it. In the meantime, you go to the UN and you speak all this other stuff while your army's invading our lands and we go, yeah, that's not so great. So I think... To me, that's how I would understand it now. And I, I realize Canadians get upset when, when they necessarily have to view their country this way. But um, I think it's, it's okay. And I think it's also the secret to how Canada can actually be what it wants. It's the secret. It's the secret. It's always been the secret. It's that our health is actually the whole the point. If we're if our communities were healthy and successful, Canada would not would be fine. Uh, like the barometer actually should be that, frankly, and not the other way around. That's I think the secret to all these colonial states. And I think what's unique for Canada is that unlike our cousins to the south we're at least willing to engage in the start of this conversation. They can't even get off. You know, I was going to use a baseball metaphor. Like they're still in the dugout. I, I was going to say they can't get off for base. I don't think they may not be in the stadium. Like they're yeah. not because they can't. When I, when I tell my cousins down South that we had a TRC, like a truth, their mind is blown. Like they can't imagine a truth and reconciliation commission in America of all places that needs one, like they need dozens of them. Um, so I think we have an advantage in that we're small, we can have this dialogue uh, uh, and we're, we are in a different spot of understanding than they are. And we can lead in this, it's, we can do it. And I think it's, and I don't think it's a threat to Canadians. I actually think, actually think Canadians should view it as the salvation 
to end a lot of the concerns would be equal partners in what this actually looks like. And, and that means our sovereignty becomes as important as Canadian sovereignty. Well, you mentioned a word there. There's a word that started with an R. Um, <laughs> and that takes us into this next question, which is what would reconciliation look like in everyday life for Indigenous people in Canada, recognizing that this is not a homogenous group? And what does the average settler who doesn't make or control policy decisions other than their own voice need to do in everyday life to further reconciliation? Well, I mean, I mean, the, to answer the second part first, I think it's, again, start with yourself. It all, all major social change starts with individuals uh, shifting their perspective. They then shift their neighborhood and it, it sort of grows from there. If you just look at the history of social justice, that is how it works. It's not governments that decide, oh, we're suddenly giving away equality today. Like that is not how it works. People fight for it and they change opinions and en masse, that's what, what changes. So you do have agency, even if you're not, you do have agency. Because remember, you're in greater number than us and the government cares more about you than it does us. So when you say, I care about this, they're more likely to listen to you than Phelan or I. Because in the end, Phelan or I, ah, you know, like, yeah, they're fun occasionally, but, you know, we, we could do with that, is basically, I would say, Canada's sort of general opinion. But they, they want you. So, like, um, use that power. That's what privilege is. Like, you're listened to more than us, so leverage it with every political party. This is one of the things I say often now is I don't give a crap about partisan politics. When you're indigenous and all of them buy into colonial rule, it does not matter, really. It's just a matter of communication and understanding their priorities. It doesn't actually change our real perspective. So it doesn't matter what, gov what government, provincial or uh, uh, federal, what party, that you just, when they come asking, say this is an issue that you want resolved um, and work on your your own center indigenous people don't center yourself and and your own sort of uh, feelings um, and then on the sort of the larger part what does reconciliation look like mm. reconciliation looks like my children being who they are whenever they want wherever they want and not being afraid that that will mean something that that is what is acceptable to Canada, that for, for indigenous people to be indigenous people. Uh, I'll get, uh, I'll, I tell a quick story in the book, just about my uh, cousin junior, who's a master, a moose hunter, uh, you know, uh, I think he is a master moose hunter, probably not as masterful as some of his stories may uh, claim. But um, anyway, if you've ever been hunting, these are stories like fishermen, you know, you got to have some creative license. Um, but like I think of that or I think of like him going out and just like doing what our family has literally done forever is how my grandmother would put it. Um, that is reconciliation. When we can go back and I know that's maybe that's amorphous, but and that is absolutely the end of the process. That's what the absolute outcome looks like is us living the way we would want on the lands we've always lived that way. Uh, and you have to understand that we have not been allowed, afforded that for a long, long time. We've been forced to live someone else's way on the play on the places and when our folks signed those treaties back before canada what was the promise is that we would get to continue to do that 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 even in the huron robinson treaty which did cede land it's written in there that we would still get to do what we do then all the time that's not how it worked out but that is i think you know to me when i when i when i see us just being us that's it and the reality is most people don't get to see us just being us because we're really usually only us when we're uh, together and alone. <laughs> uh, you know, like that native earth office, 
like that was us. You know what I mean, Phelan? Like mm -hmm. all there was no, there was no, we shed everything sort of when you came through the door. And that's what it means when people talk about like safe spaces. And I know uh, all sorts of people think that's silly, but it's like the reason why you want that is because that's where we can just be us. That's why we wanted it. And it's safe because no one else is there. And that should tell you what we're fighting for. We're fighting to feel that way everywhere. We're fighting that everywhere is safe for us to just be. And frankly, to circle back to what I was sort of touching on earlier, this is actually a lesson not just for us, but actually everyone. Because I think that everyone isn't just being very much at all. And the true disruption to the system would be if we did that. Like that's, if you want to, you know, if, if, to use a movie reference, if you want to be Neo in the Matrix, that's it. What does he do? You know, whether you want to, whether you want to correctly, I think, obviously, read that as a movie about a trans allegory. What is it an allegory about? Them being who they are. That's the whole point. They, Neo just gets to be. And I think if not just even non-Indigenous people could just be like that. And we would realize that we don't actually need a lot of this stuff we've built up. We I would actually realize that a lot of it is hurting us and we need to stop it. And that there is a, a way to, to reconcile the big thing, which is, which I think is what's happened to this planet over the last 500 years. And that's, because there's the reconciliation in the small sense, which is, you know, the TRC at a very, you know, was residential schools. But I think what people yearn for is actually that big one, is how do we actually reconcile the whole thing? And to me, that's, again, it's, it starts, it just starts with us because uh, we carry a lot of that and we need to free ourselves of that so we can actually uh, get back to the, to what's really important and upholding some of these systems actually isn't that important. We just think it is. We've been told and conditioned that it is. It, it just isn't though. Well, we're coming up close to shutter down time, but there's a, uh, I'm going to get, try and get one quick question in one last quick question. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> uh, can you talk more about the title? What does unreconciled mean to you? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I have to thank my wife, Julie, for that one. We were, uh, we were struggling with a title and um, she sort of, she, she helped the sort of, I don't know if you've ever done that feeling where you're sort of throwing ideas back and forth. And that was one she touched on. And I think it's meant to reflect both my sort of understanding of where the country is politically and the, the notions of reconciliation that have sort of been floated and the, the process, but it also is very much about me and, um, and that, uh, that the, the book and the journey that I'm on, that I think we are all on in our own way, uh, is to reconcile ourselves to, again, return to that understanding of what it is to be a human and what it is to live in a good way. Uh, and, um, that's, that was the, that was it for me was that the book, cause that's what, if you read the book, that's what the book does is it balances the personal and the political and the big issue with the personal issue. And to me, that was a title that sort of spoke to all of that. And, um, yeah, I think it, I think it worked out. And the, and the other truth failing is that Indian in the cabinet was taken. <laughs> oh, something else in the cabinet. Um, <laughs> well, Jesse, um, congratulations again on the book. Um, it's fantastic. And I, you know, before I was moderating this conversation, I went out and bought a copy. So I didn't get the free book. But that's all right, because it was a good investment. And I am happy to put my money towards um, this, this great accomplishment. Um, and it really, there's so much in here, I think, for everyone. But I think for me right now, where I am in sort of my life and my career, there's a lot of really good nuggets that have um, given me a lot to think over. Um, I'm going to turn it over now 
to Robert. Uh, I've got a little bio for Robert. It's very short, though. Robert is Anishinaabe, and he's from Cape Croker, and he's a fourth-year student studying Indigenous Studies and English at U of T. So, Robert, can you pop on? There's yep. Robert. Thank you. Uh, Ani, can we hear? What's up, good day, Indigenous guys? Nashing the and don't you buy? Chija can do them. Up to go and get you in them. Ki gosh kato yang. Ki bzindu wang. Jesse Wenti. Um, so my name is Robert, and I would just like to say get you me to Jesse, Fallon, uh, Debbie, Charlie, and, uh, and everyone else who made this possible. Uh, it was such an honor to, to be able to hear Jesse speak. Uh, Charlie actually gave me a copy of your book a few weeks ago, which was illuminating and powerful and, and uh, inspiring. Uh, and I can't put into words uh, how proud you make me to be honest now, uh, how brave you are for telling your story for speaking back uh, against Canada and these colonial institutions with your full humanity uh, and your full indigeneity. Um, it's so amazing to see someone like me doing the things you're doing, uh, making space for Indigenous people. Uh, so for me, and I'm sure many others, uh, miigwech for showing us that we're not alone, uh, that anything is possible, uh, and for being a role model on how to live a good life. So Niyawa, thank you, miigwech. Yeah, uh, uh, Robert, thank you so much. I got a note here from uh, 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 from uh, the folks behind the curtain. There, there's Charlie. Something about giveaways. I think there might be. I might. There might be free stuff. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, indeed, there will be three books uh, given away, and I'm going to keep people somewhat tantalized before I make a few announcements, and I'll uh, announce the uh, recipients of those books in just a moment. But I want to do uh, some thank yous and then just let people know about one more event that we have coming before we sort of shut down for the break. Um, so first, I mean, first and foremost, thank you so much to Jesse. Um, I was reminded, and when he mentioned Julie, that Jesse, I don't know if he's the only alum of Innes who got married in town hall, but um, <laughs> certainly, <laughs> I guess he has the, had the most memorable. Oh, look, even the dog's taking attention to that one. Uh, anyway. Um, but, you know, I feel like uh, Jesse's been a part of the college for so long and we're so uh, happy that that's the case, but also, you know, proud of him uh, on so many levels. And the talk tonight just reminds us of why that is. And Phelan, thank you for being a, a really engaged and appreciative interlocutor. Um, I don't know if I've had anyone moderate who's laughed as heartily as you have. So that's <laughs> it's the, 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 the best recommendation. Um, it's, it's a cultural thing. We laugh <laughs> loud. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and of course, to Debbie, uh, Elder Debbie Christian, uh, who's, as I've said before, whose spirit always suffuses any event she's part of. And then Robert, uh, Robert Najwan, who, uh, you know, just uh, strikes grace notes that I can't, you know, have to say I welled up a bit <laughs> when Robert spoke at the end. So very touching. And, um, and thanks to our team. Uh, you know, to uh, tonight, to Ned and Kathleen, to Shayla, to Ennis. Um, I hope I haven't forgotten anyone, but I'm sure I always do. And then I hear about it afterwards. Uh, but let me now uh, say what the, uh, last, the final event is going to be. And it's a special one. And I will say that, you know, we, uh, many of you who come to our regular events may not think that you are invited to the one I'm about to mention, but indeed you are. And it is our now, I think, fifth annual Innes Benefit Concert for the Refugee Student Fund. So most of the talent comes from Innes College. Um, uh, we're gonna have a lot of returnees from last year, including the Afro Dance Troupe and the Bedford Trio and lots of other people. So please come to that. It's going to be on December 10th, which is a Friday at 1 p.m. It will be virtual this year because that's the way we have to do it. But those of you who attended last year, it was a total blast to do it virtually and people really enjoyed it. So uh, you have only yourself to blame if you don't attend. That's, that's how I'm gonna put that. Uh, and if you want more information about it, it's on our spanking new website, which is where Jesse's event was also highlighted. So check that out. Just go to Innes College, Google it, and you'll find the event listed there. So I've done about as much promotion as anybody can bear on that. So let me just tell you now who the three book recipients are. Bruce Tucker, Gina Ficini, 
and somebody I know actually, it's just total coincidence, uh, Carla DeMarco. So those three people, uh, the, Atlanta, uh, the alumni uh, office will contact you. You will be the happy recipients of a copy of Unreconciled. And uh, with that, it's, I have nothing left to do but say thank you again to everyone. Thank you so much, Jesse. Good luck with your continued success with the book and the messages contained therein. And thank you everyone for attending and uh, good night. Hope to see you soon. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Phelan. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks everyone.